beautiful. And the work that I do now uh, concentrates on the convergence of liturgy and solidarity. Um, in other words, I ask the question, uh, how does liturgy enable us to become a community? Um, especially in cases where we're confronted with the task of building community across difference, particularly significant forms of difference, racial difference, cultural, linguistic difference. What does it mean to call ourselves a Eucharistic community in the fullest and most integral sense of the word? Uh, in a way, right, it's responding to that eschatological nature of the Eucharist that Kimberly illustrated for us this morning, right? The idea that we both are uh, and are ever on the way to becoming uh, the body of Christ uh, that, we, that we receive at the Mass, right? The Eucharist, in this sense, is both gift and task. Uh, what, in the most practical sense, then, does that call look like now, right, in this historical moment? Uh, I'm going to suggest today that nowhere are those questions more relevant uh, than in our parishes and Catholic schools right now. Uh, we're going to begin today by looking at the liturgical praxis of Pope Francis, uh, which in a way that's particularly urgent in this historical moment, lovingly and persisten persistently directs our attention to the borders, right? not only the geographical borders, uh, but also the borders in our own midst, right? the borders of race, of culture, of language, etc., that increasingly characterize our parishes and schools. Francis calls us beyond ourselves. Right, in a way, uh, you know, not out of some kind of benign desire to be politically correct and s sort of celebrate diversity in like a superficial way. Right? It's much deeper than that. Uh, Francis's call uh, is to become what in Hispanic ministry are called gente puente, right? uh, bridge builders, bridge people, so to speak. Um, it's a fundamentally Eucharistic call. Right, that call to become what we receive, to become the body of Christ. Uh, from there, I'll invite us to consider two interrelated questions. First, how can we understand the imperative of building intercultural communities in our parishes and schools and classrooms as a fundamentally Eucharistic task? Um, and second, given the sweeping demographic transformation underway in the church in the United States, which we'll discuss, uh, what are some of the key ways in which Latinos are evangelizing and catechizing the U.S. church? Right, what resources does U.S. Latino Catholicism, broadly construed, offer for the renewal of a sacramental imagination in the U.S. church? Right, typically, we phrase that question sort of the opposite way, you know, welcoming the stranger, so to speak, kind of on our terms. I invite us to sort of flip the script. Right, What are, uh, what are Latino Catholics uh, really bringing to us that's, that's renewing, that's a, that's a sign of, of new life? For the church in the United States. Uh, and then we'll conclude with your reflections, your questions, um, and I'd love to hear about your experiences in your own context as well. So let's start with Pope Francis. Pope Francis is a pastor of the borders. This is an image from February 17th, 2016. It was taken during Francis's visit to Mexico. So just before celebrating Mass in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, which is just across the border from El Paso, uh, Pope Francis is pausing for a moment of prayer here at a memorial that was constructed uh, in remembrance of those who died trying to reach the United States. Right? The memorial here, which you can see, is this towering iron cross, which is emblazoned with an image of the Holy Family fleeing into Egypt. And it's surrounded by similar, smaller crosses. It's constructed on this platform, as you can see, overlooking the border between our two countries, right, which is both visibly militarized, you can see the barbed wire there in the background, and also very fluidly transnational. Right? Actually, around 14,000 people a day cross back and forth legally, so to speak, through one of the many international bridges uh, for shopping or work or school or to visit family. So the beams of the cross there evoke the iron beams that in many places, including my former home of Brownsville, uh, form the two-story high wall between our two countries. Here's a little bit of a better view there. What Francis offers the church, I want to suggest, is an embodied interpretation of the gospel in response to the global signs of the times. The image here emblematizes that we can see, right, he's kind of waving to onlookers. You can see that image of the Holy Family there emblazoned on the cross. Right, this image emblematizes in a, in a particularly salient way the gravitational force that's at the heart of Francis's pontificate, which is this consistent pull toward the borders, right, toward the margins. 
the stance here is powerfully symbolic, right? It's also quietly subversive. Right? For three minutes about, he dwelled silently there in a space charged with the memory of decades and centuries of human suffering and injustice caused by this unnatural division. In so doing, he invites the church, he invites all of us to dwell there too, to dwell there with him. Francis invites us, in other words, to make the peripheries the center of our catechetical, liturgical, and pastoral imagination, right? to make, we might say, a preferential option for the borderlands. Dwelling there, as Francis does, what we find is that it's the crucified and risen Christ whom we encounter. The palms that surround the cross that you can see there in sort of the lower left-hand uh, part of the screen are also quietly evocative, right? Drawing our mind to Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, wherein practically in the same breath, Jesus was welcomed and condemned, right? Sort of whiplash dynamic that's not unfamiliar to immigrants, right? Who are simultaneously welcomed into this country for the economic labor they provide uh, and also often rejected uh, as humans equal in rights and dignity to the rest of us. Francis's prayer at the border was followed by the celebration of mass. The mass was simulcast actually across the border where a massive crowd uh, gathered in El Paso's Sun Bowl <laughs> to participate in sort of liturgical solidarity. Many more actually gathered along the border fence itself and the Eucharist was distributed simultaneously on both sides of the fence dividing our two countries. That image summons to mind another from the annual border masses that are celebrated or con-celebrated, I should say, by border bishops in Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and Northern Mexico. Uh, this is Bishop Kikanis. Uh, the Eucharist then, too, is distributed to the faithful through the gaps in the border fence. It's a powerful, arresting image, right? So pause for a moment and let's consider this very, very arresting image. The act of sharing the Eucharist Right, in the space of imposed division becomes a radical act of truth-telling. Right? It's a powerful witness to the self-giving love that's at the heart of the Eucharist and the heart of Jesus' own body, a love that overcomes efforts to contain it, a love that spills over walls and around fences, a love that unites what's been divided, right? a love that humanizes, that heals, that saves. The setting of Francis' liturgical and sacramental practice is not extrinsic to its meaning. In other words, Francis's celebration of the Mass at the border isn't just about an outward demonstration of solidarity. The place itself is charged with sacramental grace. The border Mass makes plain the primordial oneness of all baptized in Christ, right? the unity of Christ's body. At the same time, the perfect sacrifice of praise at the heart of the Mass celebrated in this place reveals the idolatrous nature of the rituals of violence performed each day in these borderlands, right? Distorted sacrifices to idols with names like security and nationalism and the rule of law. It's an animetic act, right? An act of remembrance of Jesus' self-giving sacrifice, itself grounded in the communal memory of the people of Israel to which the texts of the Old Testament hearken back constantly, right? A, a text that's recited at the Passover meal to this day, a text which Jesus himself would have recited as he celebrated the Passover feast, right? Remember, O Israel. Right? You hear that again and again. Remember, O Israel, that you too were once strangers in that land. You shall not oppress a stranger, for you know the feelings of a stranger. Francis issues us the incarnational invitation to pitch our tents on the borders, right? the in-between spaces where nations, races, cultures, languages, classes, generations, and histories touch. For there, he shows us, do we encounter Christ. In word and deed, Pope Francis invites us to view the borders as what in theology we would call a locus ecclesiologicus, right? as a place from which emerges renewed ways of conceiving and being church, propelled and guided by the Spirit of God. But living, as we do, right, in the midst of profound political and ideological polarization, <laughs> advocating for what we might call a theological and pastoral option for the borderlands is not an easy argument to make. Right? And our distorted national imagination, speaking primarily to those of us from the United States, right, the specter of the border looms large as both sort of a dam, right, holding back oncoming tides of the undesired other, 
right? And also as a frontier to be conquered militarily, economically, culturally. In our national imagination and in our national conversation, borderlands are checkpoints, right? Endpoints, spaces of danger and suspicion uh, beyond which we dare venture typically only as either tourists or service workers, right? Never as equals, lest, too we, uh, lest we too become undesirable. Right? They're spaces from which, like Nazareth, we who are formed to fear them come to feel that nothing good can ever come. Right? In our national imagination, then, the architectural form proper to the borderland is not the bridge, but rather the iron fence or the concrete wall. Taught to fear our geographical borderlands, we imbibe, in turn, a fear of the borderlands that exist within our own near communities. Right? The spaces in our churches, our schools, our neighborhoods where races, cultures, and classes meet. This fear must be rejected as opposed to the peace at the heart of the gospel. Re-envisioning borders, not as spaces where relationships and identities end, but rather where they begin, we are able to see them as spaces infused with the possibility of encounter, of communion, of salvation. Right? This theological transvaluation of the border, to use the phrase of Cuban-American theologian Roberto Goizueta, is not merely the replacement of a false negative image of the border with an equally false romanticized one, right? the sort of rosy, idealized image of the joyful poor that we often come away from mission trips with. Right? Rather, it's the replacement of a false image with a real one, right? an image of the border as it truly is, a space where the unifying spirit of God breathes <laughs> new life into the church. Right? Solidarity across borders becomes a real possibility when we approach this joining not as an act of condescending service or a begrudging welcome, right? but as a soteriological act, born of a desire for true communion with our neighbors, a desire to be formed ever more perfectly into the body we receive in the Eucharist. Right, a recognition that we're not saved as individuals or as homogenous, comfortable enclaves, but as a people, right? as one people. If this is the case, then the question Pope Francis implicitly poses to us, and which I pose to us here this afternoon, is where are the borderlands in our midst? Right? Where are the borderlands in our midst to which we are called in our everyday lives, in our everyday work? It's tempting to believe that the call of missionary discipleship, right, this outward centrifugal impulse toward loving encounter of which Pope Francis so often speaks, uh, compels us to journey somewhere else. Right? As Americans, our largely racially, culturally, and economically segregated existence encourages the misconception that in order to encounter difference in consequential and challenging ways, we need to travel far, far away. <laughs> um, but the notion that the place for solidarity is somewhere else is a deceptive one. Right? Because in some ways it exculpates us from our responsibility to scrutinize the contours of our own local realities. So I want to suggest that one place, and a very important place, that we can respond to the call to solidarity across borders is within our parishes and schools. Right? The context within you here this week work and minister, most of you. During the remainder of our time here this evening, I'll invite us to unpack what it might mean to view our parishes and schools as places where we might respond to Francis's invitation to Eucharistic solidarity. So we'll set, the, we'll set the national landscape for a moment. We'll set the scene. The Catholic Church in the US is in the midst of a profound transformation, which I'm sure you have heard about, read about, are currently experiencing in your own context of ministry and practice, right? This is a transformation that's being played out most vividly at the level of the parish. Today, more than one third of Catholic parishes in the US serve multiple cultural, ethnic, or linguistic communities. This is good news, uh, actually, because studies of American congregational life, American religious life, have been unequivocal for decades in demonstrating that most Americans worship with people who look like ourselves, racially, culturally, linguistically. Uh, so this is not a large number, right? 33 or so percent is not a large number, but it's a number that's growing, right? And that's, and that's good news. Colloquially, we tend to refer to parishes like this as multicultural, uh, but in fact, uh, as those of you who uh, 
perhaps uh, go to, uh, that belong to, work in such contexts can attest. Uh, calling parishes like these multicultural is often a little bit of an overstatement, <laughs> right? Typically at parishes like these, um, <laughs> St. Clair being my favorite example in Santa Clara, California, there's an English, an English family mass, Portuguese mass, Spanish, Cantonese, Mandarin, Chinese youth, and then uh, to finish the day, bookend the day with another English mass. So this is, a, this is a, an extreme example. Right, but typically in parishes like these, you see often an English community and a Spanish community, right? Two, three, sometimes four or more communities uh, kind of sh sharing a single space, uh, orbiting around each other more or less, participating in culturally distinct ministries, uh, going to culturally linguistically distinct masses, maybe intersecting for brief moments in the parking lot or at a bilingual mass once or twice a year, but more or less sort of passing like ships in the night. So scholars in the U.S. Catholic bishops uh, term such parishes shared parishes uh, because in most cases that's exactly what they are, right? A couple of communities uh, that are more or less distinct sharing the same space and not very much else typically. While Catholic parishes have been sites of intercultural encounter uh, for as long as the church has been a presence in what's now the United States, the present moment right, is unique in a few key and somewhat interesting ways. Uh, and perhaps, again, perhaps you'll see some of these trends reflected in your own classrooms and parish contexts. Right. First, it's impossible to overstate the significance of the demographic transformation that's underway in the church in the US, uh, particularly the extent to which Latinos are reshaping the church. Uh, around 40% of US Catholics are Hispanic or Latino. Hispanic uh, and Latino not necessarily being synonyms, uh, Hispanic typically referring to Spanish speakers, uh, so could be from Spain. Uh, Latino uh, typically referring uh, to those who are from Latin America. Um, uh, so so if, uh, when we talk about uh, Hispanic presence, that would implicitly exclude Brazil, for example. If we talk about Latinos, we would be talking about Brazil. So. But well, I'll, I'll use those terms more or less interchangeably, just a little bit of background. So around 40% of US Catholics are Hispanic or Latino. Um, and more than half, more than half of Catholic millennials, teens, and children in the US are Latino. Right? More than half, right? About 3% of Catholics in the US are African American, African or Afro Caribbean. Another 5% or so are Asian, and that's a number that's also increasing. Overall, according to estimates by the U.S. Catholic bishops, more than half of U.S. Catholics today are not of Euro-American descent. Right? And that is a real transformation. That's a real change. Uh, a quarter of Catholics in this country were born outside the U.S. So while uh, they, the oft-repeated notion, sometimes we hear that we're a, we're a church of immigrants, uh, that's a descriptor that's inadequate in some ways uh, because it excludes the experiences of African Americans and Native American Catholics. But in other ways, it's very much the case, right? We're, a, we're an immigrant church on earth. And that's not an exaggeration. It's also worth noting uh, the geographical transformation underway in the church in the US. Right? While the former sort of urban Catholic strongholds in the upper Midwest, in the Northeast, Boston, Philadelphia, Chicago, New York, et cetera, are shuttering parishes, combining parishes, closing Catholic schools, which is a, a very, very painful process, which I know from living in Boston for many years. In the South, where I currently live, we can't build <laughs> parishes fast enough. Right? The largest parish in the United States is in North Carolina randomly, <laughs> right? It's like the least Catholic state, I think, in the Union. Um, and yet St. Matthew's is home to basically a, a small city. It's the largest parish in the nation, right? In Knoxville, they just built a new cathedral. Atlanta, where I live, I think is the, um, the largest, or I think fastest growing diocese in the nation. Um, this growth, uh, particularly in the South, is due really in no small part to the effects of immigration, right? So overall, Latino, African, African American, Asian, and Native American Catholics are responsible for the continued growth and vitality of Catholicism in the US. Right, I'll say that again. Latino, African, African American, Asian, and Native American Catholics are responsible for the continued growth and vitality of Catholicism in the US. Yet, this demographic reality is not reflected in the faces of those who lead the church, right? both lay and ordained. It's also very much at odds with Catholic school enrollment and discourse on Catholic education. Right? While about 55% of Catholic school-aged children in the US are Latino, 55% of kids who could potentially be in Catholic schools, only about 4% of them are enrolled in Catholic schools. Yeah. 
Latino young people and other young people of color are also highly underrepresented in religious education programs, in youth groups, retreats, and other faith formation and leadership-oriented activities at the parish level. Right? This creates sort of a vicious cycle. Right? Latinos aren't leading the church because they aren't being welcomed into spaces where that leadership formation happens, uh, and then they don't participate in leadership formation programs because they don't see themselves reflected in the faces of those who lead them, and so on and so forth. Right. Additionally, conversations at parishes, dioceses, and especially, I would say especially, universities often proceed without any attention to the fact that the majority of Catholic youth are Latino. Right. I can't tell you how many conversations, at, you know, multiple levels I've been involved in on the future of religious education uh, where not a single Latino voice was present in the room and where the conversation proceeds as though nothing has changed in the last 40 years. <laughs> right? This is ludicrous. <laughs> we need to begin equipping leaders from within Latino and other new immigrant communities, not simply to join with us or partner with us in the work that we do, but to lead the way in this work. And we need to be ready to share and relinquish that leadership power to those new leaders. Second, second transformation underway in the Catholic Church today in the US. Models of parish life have changed, right? While the coexistence, as I said, of multiple cultural communities in a single parish is not something that's new, this model of the shared parish as sort of a community of communities, as it's often called, um, is something that's becoming increasingly common. In the past, particularly in dioceses, like Chicago, for example, uh, where uh, the establishment of national and ethnic parishes was most common. So you got your Polish parish, your Italian parish, your Slovak parish, your Irish parish, you know, all within a one block radius, more or less, right? The sharing of a single parish by multiple cultural groups was often understood as sort of an interim state, right? Okay, we'll share this space until, you know, these newcomers can petition the bishop for a, a parish of their own. And then that parish would be established, and then they would, you know, proceed to the Italian parish or the Slovak parish or whatever has been established for them. When that wasn't an option, right, typically sort of efficient Americanization of the newcomers was the goal. <laughs> Today, uh, the culturally shared parish is no longer a temporary arrangement, right? It's a unique and emerging model of church life in its own right. Yet, the coexistence of multiple cultural communities in a single parish still feels in some way like kind of an ad hoc arrangement, right? Like something that works for the time being, but also has a sense of tentativeness about it. Whenever I speak to anyone who belongs to a, a, a shared parish, uh, lay or ordained, right? most of the time they express some kind of mild discomfort about the fact that they belong to a parish uh, in which you know, they, there's an entire group of people that they never interact with whatsoever based on differences of language or ethnicity. Right? I hear this especially from pastors, actually. Most people acknowledge that they don't know exactly what to do about it um, or where to begin or how to take the first step, but, but the discomfort is there. Right? We're aware of this and we don't really know what to do. Third transformation, attitudinal and ideological shifts have occurred, both within the church and broader society with respect to diversity, right? Generally speaking, uh, public attitudes with respect to cultural diversity have shifted away from assimilationism, right? The idea that newcomers should jump in the proverbial melting pot and kind of come out a full-fledged, flag-waving, apple pie-eating American, and at least toward a nominal <laughs> appreciation of cultural diversity, right? Theologically, the notion of inculturation, which entered the, the Catholic missiological lexicon after Vatican II, uh, expressed the idea that the gospel can find a home in any culture, right? Just as Christ became corporeal and in particular in Galilee, so too can the gospel take on flesh within the cultural particularity of any human community. In more recent years, bishops have uh, moved away from the idea of, of inculturation, have begun to speak more about inter, uh, interculturality or, or integration, or, or often the language of communion is used uh, to describe this vision of unity and diversity that we're striving towards. Right, and of course, these aren't just abstract trends. Many of you here this evening are likely experiencing these realities firsthand uh, in your own parishes, your own classrooms, right? An English-speaking community and a Spanish-speaking community, or a, you know, or a Korean community, or a Brazilian community, or a Vietnamese community. In the Archdiocese of Boston, for example, uh, Mass is said in 27 different languages every, uh, every Sunday. And it, actually, in LA, I believe it's closer to 50. Uh, you can find Mass in 50 languages every Sunday in the, in the Archdiocese of LA. Uh, and if you think you're from a parish or school that isn't experiencing these transformations, Talk to me again in five years. <laughs> I guarantee you that will have changed, right? This is, this is the direction that we're going. 
Right, so our parishes and our Catholic schools are, in a real sense, right, the borderlands in our midst of which Francis speaks. Perhaps more so than any other civic or social institution we're part of, parishes are places where we're invited into the challenging task of joining with and loving other people in their difference, right? Not to the extent that they're the same as me, but loving them because they are different than me, right? That's not easy. Right? This is a very different call than the sort of nice sounding suggestion that we should celebrate diversity, right? which demands nothing more of us than a general tolerance of the existence of people who are not ourselves. Right? Solidarity and difference requires something much deeper. Right? In the words of Gustavo Gutierrez, right, it requires a true conversion to the other, right? a willingness to be challenged in our presumption of normativity, right? a willingness to be the guest in the very place where we're used to being the host. Right, as Notre Dame professor Tim Madavina often says, it's not just about welcoming the stranger. Right? It's about cultivating spaces in which all truly belong. So given uh, the theme of this week, right, this symposium, how as catechists and Catholic educators can liturgical and sacramental practice, uh, and perhaps more deeply, a liturgical imagination, right, help to build bridges across borders in our parishes and schools? Social scientists. Uh, have asked the question in a related, if somewhat drier, way. How does ritual practice cultivate social solidarity? It's the way that social scientists would phrase that question. Right? Ritual on its own, of course, we know, doesn't magically produce community like a, you know, an equation or a commodity. Yet studies suggest that ritual does play a critical role in cultivating and strengthening social bonds. Right? There's a great deal of research to support the idea that participating in commonly held pre-established rituals leads to intergroup cooperation. So what does that mean? For example, when a faith-sharing group recites the Lord's Prayer at the beginning of each meeting, or you begin your class with a prayer each day. The research suggests that performing that ritual action consistently helps you all to strengthen your bond as a group. Uh, at the school where I taught in Brownsville, every day at noon, all of the students and teachers gathered on the patio to, play, to, uh, to pray the Angelus. Um, and it was a pre-K through eight school. And if you want to just die <laughs> from adorableness. <laughs> Watch a bunch of first graders pray the Angelus. It's the sweetest thing you've ever seen in your entire life. Anyway, sociologists would say that the daily practice of this commonly held ritual uh, contributed in some way to the strengthening of community at my school, which I think in some way it did. Interestingly, however, a recent study also found that new rituals in newly formed groups can, when repeated, also promote intergroup bonding. In this study, researchers took people who didn't know one another at all, uh, who had never met before, and divided them into small groups. And half of the small groups were asked to begin their group meetings uh, by performing a set of ritual actions, and the other half were not. And when this, what the study found uh, was that those who began their groups with ritual evinced a higher level of intergroup care and bonding than those who didn't. Interesting. What that points to is the idea that shared communal participation helps to cement social bonds, even among people who are very different, right? who don't necessarily know much about each other, who perhaps have little in common beyond that ritual space. Scholars of diverse congregations, uh, both here primarily in the research Protestant congregations, um, but the lessons are certainly uh, transferable, have also pointed to the vital role of ritual practice in cultivating community in religious contexts. So uh, a sociologist named R. Stephen Warner, who's sort of a, a magisterial voice in the sociology of religion, um, it was sort of summarized decades of study after study that he's conducted in a, in a number of religious contexts all throughout the world, kind of ethnographic studies uh, of, of a number of different contexts. Um, and he emphasizes what he calls the crucial role of embodied ritual is a key to the capacity religion has to bridge boundaries, both between communities and individuals. And I'm sure you can see a lot of uh, sort of uh, connections between this and, and the Montessori method. Right? Uh, Chris Titus, who's a scholar of US Latino Catholicism, argues that the spiritual and moral power of popular religious rituals, so devotional rituals, for example, is related to their capacity to become sites of integration and boundary transgression. So ritual practice, he argues, renders ambiguous boundaries between past and present, between me and you, right? between us and them, participant and observer, sacred and ordinary. When distinctions between us and them are ritually transgressed, he argues, removed at the moral level through feelings of empathy and solidarity. 
practical wisdom, right, also affirms this connection between ritual and community, right? Think about the 4th of July, think about a sports game, think about the rituals that we perform in civic and social institutions on a regular basis, right? They create bonds between people in shared parishes, right? Bilingual liturgies often represent best attempts, not always very successful attempts, but at least best attempts to build bridges between members of distinct linguistic communities, right? So bilingual masses can, of course, be you know, onerous and disjointed and hard, <laughs> as, as those of you, who, oh, those of you who, have, who have attended them or, or helped to, uh, to plan them can, can attest. Uh, and this is especially the case, of course, where such practices aren't necessarily the norm. Uh, but the significance of these efforts shouldn't be overlooked, right? Indeed, such attempts at fostering community through shared linguistically inclusive liturgical participation events an instinct similar to those elaborated by the scholars I just mentioned, right? We sense that we become community by, by doing community in some way, right? The community isn't necessarily a noun, but a verb, right? This is also, of course, the insights of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd and Montessori, you know, other kind of Montessori-based pedagogical methods um, are absolutely brilliant, right, so perfectly suited to the ecclesial landscape in which we find ourselves. Uh, this emphasis on embodied learning, right, on lived practice, on creating together, working together, playing together, means that learning isn't the mere transmission of knowledge, right, just as we talked about, but more fully it becomes the, the cultivation of a community, right. Just as children, and really all of us, <laughs> learn by, by doing, right, we also learn community, by doing community. So how does liturgical practice, understood as a kind of communal ritual, enable us to do community, so to speak, particularly in contexts characterized by significant cultural difference? <coughs> to answer that question, I turn to the work of religious studies scholar Adam Seligman and anthropologist Robert Weller, both are, uh, of whom are at Boston University. Uh, Seligman and Weller conceive of ritual as subjunctive action what they call subjunctive action. That term will uh, maybe mean more to those in the room who speak or have studied Spanish, uh, but I'll explain what they mean, right? Actually, English also has a subjunctive tense, but we don't typically learn that in, uh, in grammar school. When I speak in the present tense, right, I name things as they are. So um, I am in a classroom, present tense. Uh, we speak in the subjunctive tense when we name things as, they, as we wish they were. Uh, right, as we as we hope they would be, as we desire that they might become. So I could say, uh, I'm in a I'm in a classroom, present tense. Uh, I wish I were on a beach, subjunctive tense. <laughs> no, I don't. I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> right, how about a more substantive example? Right, I could say in my parish. Uh, there's a separate English community, Spanish community, and Vietnamese community, and we don't really know what to do with each other. Present tense, reality as it is. I wish we were a more integrated community. Subjunctive tense, speaking as I wish things were. Right? So when Seligman and Weller call ritual subjunctive action, what they mean is that ritual can be understood as the imaginative communal practice of a shared as if, right? a shared kind of vision of a desired community. Uh, they say it's the creation of an order as if it were truly the case. Ritual allows us to practice being the kind of community we wish we were or that we would like to become. Ritual offers communities of difference a shared embodied lexicon, a sort of common script, not only of words, but also of movement and images and tangible signs, right? Of sacramental food and drink, of story and art and song, for living into the kind of community that we hope to become, right? The body of Christ. So they say ritual is about doing something more than it's about saying something, right? It's the doing itself that lends ritual its power and meaning. So in contexts of profound diversity, which is to say, right, in the absence of commonly agreed upon language or meanings or identities uh, in a shared parish, for example, or a very diverse school, ritual can be efficacious precisely because participants don't all need to hold an identical set of meanings or identities in order to participate, right? Ritual is capacious. Right? It's large. It can encompass all of us. Far from consolidating group identity in a, in a uniform way, ritual should be understood as, as kind of disclosing a unique capacity to encompass and mediate difference and ambiguity without necessarily seeking to resolve it. 
of course, our common baptism calls us to a, a sort of unity in heart and mind, right? And yet we also recognize that unity isn't the same as uniformity. Right? The profound diversity of the church in the U.S. is in some way a microcosm of the global church, right? in which our social, cultural, and historical particular experiences of the call of discipleship are very, very, very different from those of one another. So Seligman and Weller argue that the work of ritual, they say, teaches us to live within and between different boundaries rather than seeking to absolutize them. Ritual forms communal imaginations by existing on the borderlines of reality in that liminal space between already and not yet. Ritual, in this sense, can be compared to play, right? Or to, to children's work in the atrium, right? It's this joyful, embodied, creative imagining of a world that could be, that might be, that we hope to be, right? We act like a community. And when we do it over and over and over again, in some way, we become a community. Interestingly, uh, and this is a, a little bit of an aside, but an interesting one <laughs> for those of us who often puzzle over the question of, for example, why young people aren't coming to Mass. <laughs> uh, the authors of, uh, of the study that I just mentioned contrast ritual modes of behavior, right, this as-if mode of behavior, with what they term sincere modes of behavior, or as-is. Right? This is a line of argumentation similar to those who've been, that have been made about the contrast between Catholic and Protestant worldviews more broadly. Catholics supposedly espousing a worldview of presence, of enchantment, of sacramentality. Protestants espousing one of rationality, of divine absence, or sincerity, they say. Uh, sincerity, Seligman and Weller argue, is sort of a modern trope evidenced most uh, clearly in the present preoccupation with authenticity. As if you work with youth, you probably are, particularly in a college campus ministry setting, you probably hear young people talking a lot about the desire to be authentic, <laughs> right? The unspoken assumption there about this notion of authenticity, they argue, it seems to be that something is authentic only when it's personally and individually chosen. So if you don't choose it, the logic goes it can't truly be meaningful to you. So Catholic college kids who don't go to mass, for example, sometimes explain this decision in the well-meaning language of authenticity, right? They don't know what they believe anymore. They're sort of questioning their faith. So they feel like it would be insincere of them to participate in the ritual, right? It doesn't feel authentic, they argue. But Seligman and Weller argue, ritual doesn't require and isn't necessarily concerned with individual choice in this way, right? To illustrate the point, the authors offer a, a helpful example drawn from everyday life. Right, imagine uh, a family of five, so two parents and three kids. Right? While their home life is generally stable and loving and happy, their day-to-day -day is filled with, you know, normal family stuff. Fighting and hair pulling and hitting and taking each other's clothes and toys and squabbling, you know, the ordinary kind of noise of everyday life. The parents decide that family members need to start treating one another with a little more respect, <laughs> right? A little more please and thank you, a little more helping clear the dinner table, a little more niceness to each other, etc. right? What the parents are asking is not that family members love each other more, right? They already love each other, right? And even if they didn't, right? Even if there were some deep and consequential rift that existed between them, simply demanding that the children feel more love toward each other is not going to be effective. What the parents are asking uh, is that the family members start acting as if they love each other, which they do, right? They say, uh, the authors, uh, in, in the words of the author, right, what, what was missing, they say, was the behavior that would create a shared subjunctive ritual. They say, Eric Siegel was wrong. Love does not mean never having to say you're sorry. That is precisely what love does mean, <laughs> at least if you want to share a life with the person that you love. Love does not grow by telling other people that we love them. Love grows by acting as if we love them, right? Love, as the saying goes, is a verb, right? So is communion. So is community, right? Getting it right is a matter of doing it again and again and again, right? It's an act of world construction. It's very Aristotelian, right? We become what we do. How do I become a virtuous person? I start acting like a virtuous person. How do we become a community? We start acting like a community. How do we do that? Through rituals of community. Community isn't a feeling, right? It's a habit. Ritual becomes, in other words, the language of community. And it doesn't require that you give up your culture, or I give up my culture, or my identity, or that we even exist in perfect harmony, right? This doesn't have to be a utopia. It means that we practice doing life together, right? There's a reason that we call our faith a practice. We're 
practicing doing life together. And that's what ritual, including Eucharistic ritual, is. It's a practice of our faith. Right? And that kind of practice can be transformative. As the late Notre Dame uh, professor, uh, Father Virgil Alessandro writes, uh, through ritual participation and celebration, we begin to experience a new kind of we, right? a new kind of belonging. It's an experience of community that emerges in practice before it emerges in theory. Uh, it's lived before it's understood. It's very Montessorian in that way. And the best part is that it's not only about us. <laughs> right? The Eucharist is a communal ritual of thanksgiving to God. It draws us together in gratitude beyond ourselves united in the work of praise, whose object is our creator. Theologically, Seligman and Weller's understanding of ritual as subjunctive action finds, of course, an analogy in Christian notions of eschatology. Uh, the subjunctive as-if world created by ritual practice exists in that tension between the already of the incarnation and the often painful not yet of the kingdom of God, right? between the body we receive, the body that we are, uh, and the even more perfect body we seek and hope to become. So, to get practical for a moment, in my pastoral experience and in my research, uh, intercultural liturgy and other forms of intercultural practice in your parishes and your schools works when five things are true. Um, and this is not a conclusive list, um, but it's certainly a start. Right? First, when it's highly embodied. So accenting highly embodied elements of our faith practice, the sign of peace, for example, uh, or processions, other highly embodied moments in the liturgy or in our prayer life together, um, gives participants the opportunity for embodied participation, right? to touch, to embrace, to walk together in a literal way. Right? The Eucharist, in this sense, is a, is a ritual par excellence. Second, when it's highly participatory. Right? The more lay people from all cultural communities that are, no, that are involved in the planning, the implementation, and the evaluation, the better. Right? It's messier this way, um, but people have to feel like they have a stake. Right? As long as you have a good leader helping to bring it all together, get as many cooks in the proverbial kitchen as possible. Right? Everybody has a small job. Can you read this? Can you bring this? Can you bring the flowers? Can you write this? Can you make the flyer, et cetera? Uh, and Montessori classrooms actually are brilliant at this. My three-year-old daughter just made uh, banana muffins in her class <laughs> yesterday. Actually, she came home with one very proudly in a bag. And she proudly announced to me that it was her job uh, to put the salt on the counter. Now, everyone in the class had a job, and, her, and she was very proud. I, put the, I said, Nora, what did you say? I put the salt on the counter. I said, wow, that's lovely. So everybody had a steak. Everybody had a job. And the product is something beautiful and delicious. Right? Third, when people expect imperfection and discomfort. Right? In the world of business, I believe this is called managing expectations. Right? Working bilingually and interculturally. Uh, you know, doing bilingual liturgy, for example, making culturally inclusive classrooms can feel disjointed and hard. And it is hard. It's very, very hard. Right? Liturgy, we say, is the work of the people. Uh, liturgy in context of diversity is the hard work of the people. Right? As, a, as a lay leader working interculturally in my Boston parish put it, we have to work really hard at figuring out how we hear one another's voices. Um, and sometimes it feels like a lot of work. Um, but thinking about community as a habit, right, as a practice, um, we believe in some sense that taking the long view, this hard work will bear fruit in the end. Uh, fourth, when it's done in conjunction with a larger vision or mission of intercultural collaboration at the parish or school. Right, as we said, right, liturgy isn't magic. It's not a chemistry equation. It has to be part of a broader structural effort uh, to enact justice from, you know, at all areas of parish life, right? from equity and compensation to empowered leadership and representation and decision making and culturally responsive ministry. Right? What we don't want is to invoke sort of hazy notions of communion as a, as a solution to the real challenges of inclusion in our parishes. Right? Our Eucharistic theology and practice is only good as our concrete practices of love and justice. And finally, uh, when it's supplemented by opportunities uh, for celebration and social life, right? wherein people come to form friendships and actually you know, genuinely love and care about each other. Um, so uh, there's a reason why, um, at least in, in, in most forms of US Latino theology, um, when you talk about the practice of see, judge, act, um, there's always a fourth step added on, and that's celebrate. <laughs> um, right? the, the, our, our liturgical life together should be framed by celebration, right? giving us opportunities to, to come to genuinely love and cherish one another beyond the liturgical space. 
So finally, right, turning now uh, to our final and perhaps most uh, important point, we could say, we speak often in the church about the new evangelization. Uh, part of what's new about the new evangelization uh, is the call to recognize the many ways uh, in which uh, the church in the U.S. And, and each one of ourselves is in need of renewal. Right? So adopting a posture of humility and of openness. Uh, we recognize the ways that we ourselves, you know, as, as catechists and educators and pastoral ministers and, and people of faith, I yearn for an ongoing encounter with the gospel. I love the question about, like, can we, can, can we do what you just did for adults? Because that was very, very lovely, right? And part of, a, part of what's, what's new about the new evangelization is, is recognizing this need for our own ongoing formation. Right? So when I said earlier that Latino, African, African American, Asian American, and Native American Catholics are responsible for the continued growth and vitality of the church in the US, right? I wasn't just speaking numerically. Right? Indeed, it would be a mistake, really a mistake, to commit ourselves to the task of intercultural communion on the basis of the numbers, right? which is something that you often hear. Right? This idea that giving the alarming numbers of mostly uh, white Catholics leaving the church, <laughs> adult white Catholics leaving the church, we need to embrace Latinos and other newcomers in order to uh, ensure butts in the pews, essentially, in order to keep our parishes open. Um, we talk about Latinos and other newcomers to the church in the US as sort of the, the salvation of the church numerically. In, in the US. While this is the case in some uh, like very basic way, <laughs> um, we should really reject any urge to instrumentalize these newcomers, right? Rather, recognizing that the center of gravity in the US, um, in US Catholicism, is shifting uh, in a real way toward Latino communities, the question we should be asking, right, and a more fruitful question to be asking is, what are some of the ways in which Latinos are evangelizing the US church? In what way are Latino communities, Latino families, and parishes, and our dioceses renewing the U.S. church? Right? Uh, I'm obviously going to be painting in, in rather broad strokes here. Right? There's, of course, no singular Latino experience any more than there's a singular Euro-American experience. Right? Latinos, of course, are not a monolithic cultural group. Uh, that being said, even painting with our broadest brush, there are definite lessons that we can learn from one another. I want to highlight three specific ways in which Latino Catholicism is evangelizing, is teaching, is catechizing the U.S. church. First, intergenerational approaches to ministry. This photo is from a TV show called Jane the Virgin, which is on CW and also Netflix, and it's absolutely excellent. It's probably the best show currently on network TV, in my very, very biased opinion. And um, if you want a really, really beautiful uh, and also very, very funny <laughs> and uh, overly dramatic uh, vision of, of an intergenerational uh, Catholic Latino family in the US, um, watch Jane the Virgin because it's, it actually is really, really brilliant um, in its approach to cultural Catholicism. So shameless plug for what I love. Great show. Um, but one of the areas of ministry um, in which I see catechesis programs struggling most, con uh, most consistently is in navigating the challenge of, uh, I guess what we could call, catechesis throughout the life course. So getting youth to keep coming after confirmation, getting parents and families involved, offering adult catechesis, adult education, etc. Models of ministry in Latino context tend to be much more deeply intergenerational. Okay? And this is really a gift. This is really a, something that we can learn from. So for example, um, I'll give you an example. We actually have a hard time translating Latino models of youth ministry in U.S. context, or I'm sorry, it, we have a hard time translating Latino models of youth ministry to U.S. context. Um, and it's hard to get uh, Latino youth involved in traditional American youth groups. Um, and there's a reason for this. Right? It's because Pastoral Juvenil Hispana, what we would call youth ministry, what we translate as youth ministry, is actually far more intergenerational in Latino context than U.S. models of youth ministry are. Uh, so the word youth, in Latin America, joven uh, encompasses like young teenagers through people in their 30s. So those of you who've been um, to World Youth Day or led groups to World Youth Day, you probably noticed that the groups from um, Latin America and Europe uh, often look and seem a lot older <laughs> than the groups from the US. Often the US groups almost look like kids um, and, and it seems like a lot of kind of the, the, the average age is actually much older than the groups that are coming from the US. Um, and that is 
accurate. <laughs> um, and the reason for that is that the word youth, and in the, in the kind of the category of youth in Latin America and in many places in Europe, actually encompasses a much broader and in general a much older age group than we tend to think of youth as like high schoolers in the United States. So what does this mean? Right, it means that for Latinos, broadly speaking, catechesis and youth ministry and really all forms of ministry tend to be much more intergenerational, right? More, more kind of family oriented, more organic, more integral than what we're used to here in the US, right? From babies through the elderly, right? Even invoking, as Tim said, kind of the memories of, of loved ones in the past. It's like the entire communion of saints present all the time. Right? This is part of the beauty of being in a Latino parish. Uh, the, the beauty of this more intergenerational approach, right, is that it creates mentorship ties, right, in this really organic way. In the US, we tend to have a um, kind of a tendency to compartmentalize our ministry, right? Catechesis to young children and sacrament prep and confirmation prep and middle school youth ministry and high school youth ministry and young adult ministry and ad adult education and ministry to the elderly, et cetera. So we have these very kind of siloed ministries. And there are reasons for this, of course, right? But the example of Hispanic ministry invites us to think more holistically about how we can foster intergenerational communion. So the questions we might ask then are, you know, how can we reimagine catechesis as a, as a family affair, right? And again, this is something that uh, Catechesis of the Good Shepherd and Montessori approaches are kind of really, really brilliant at, right? Kind of transcending these stark generational boundaries that we've created, um, you know, and, and not as sort of an afterthought, right, or like an add on, like, you know, family night or something like that, but as an integral dimension of the catechetical task, right? And this is something, as I said, that Catechesis of the Good Shepherd and Montessori tends to be very, very, very good at and is really a kind of provides a, a model for the rest of us to learn from, <clears throat> right? How can we consistently draw on the wisdom of parents, of grandparents, of, of godparents? How can we help young people, right, to see themselves not as isolated in individuals, right, on a kind of a timeline, but rather as a, a participant in a community of memory, right? I think this is something that Tim talked about on Monday, right? This is, after all, the meaning of tradition, right? inaugurating young people into, into an understanding of themselves as a participant in a community of memory. So gift number two, right? The evangelizing capacity of beauty, right? Much of the vitality of US Latino Catholicism comes from a fundamental recognition of the aesthetic dimension of the sacramental imagination, right? Of truth revealed through beauty. Right? This is emblematized most vividly often by the, by the Guadalupe tradition. Right, Guadalupe, as the, as the story goes, chose Juan Diego, who's a poor indigenous farmer, right, one truly on the margins, to receive her revelation. Right, and when he's received by the bishop, <coughs> pardon me, the bishop, who is, of course, in the, the seat of power, right, he doubts the veracity of this poor indigenous man's vision. So Guadalupe makes roses grow out of season on Tepeyac Hill and instructs Juan Diego to gather them up and show them to the bishop. So he gathers them up in his cloak um, and presents them to the bishop. And when, when the shower of roses falls at the bishop's feet, of course, this magnificent image of the Virgin of Guadalupe appears on his cloak on his tilma. Right? And this is the image that, that currently uh, hangs in the Basilica in Mexico City. Right, so the story Guadalupe and Juan Diego is, is compelling on its own, right? It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful and sort of a fascinating, uh, fascinating and very generative story, <coughs> right? But it's the beauty of her image, right? The beauty of the image of Guadalupe that, you know, it sort of carries this aesthetic charge, right? That's <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of years has converted the hearts and the theological imaginations of millions of millions of people, right? That draws millions of pilgrims every year to Mexico City, right? There's a reason that her image is everywhere in Latino and Latin American neighborhoods, right? Her beauty feels like a conduit of grace, right? Actually, this image right there is from, um, there's a, it's much larger here than it is in real life, um, but it's a small shrine um, at my parish in Brownsville um, that was always sort of changing every day as, as people would lay their, you know, flowers from their garden or from their quinceañeras at her, at her feet. Um, it was this, this really just beautiful, beautiful space. Right, there's a reason actually for this emphasis on the aesthetic in Latino culture. Right, I love this on the, on the BW Beetle. <laughs> right, the, the Latino devotional cosmology is rooted in uh, Iberian pre-Tridentine Catholicism. So what that means is uh, Spanish colonizers and missionaries uh, initially brought Catholicism to the New World, so-called, uh, before the Council of Trent had a chance to really make its effects 
felt in rural Spain, where they were from. Uh, so Trent, the Council of Trent, broadly speaking, uh, organized the church into the parish system and kind of streamlined sacramental practice uh, and kind of smoothed over, we could say, the more uh, en enchanted, magical-seeming, irrational, popular, lay-led elements of devotional piety. Uh, and so Catholic lived practice in Latin America developed for centuries, really, in, in relative isolation from what was happening in Europe, right? It was this sort of greater rationalization, I guess we can say, of the faith. Um, and so as a result, um, this, this very, very deeply aesthetic tradition um, of popular piety from Latin America is something that's still very much an animating source of kind of theological and pastoral reflection in Latino communities. <coughs> right, Latin American sacred art, for those of you who have spent time in U.S. Latino communities or in Latin America, um, are the Latin American sacred art, that statuary, you know, is, is often very graphic, right? Particularly um, of the crucifixion, right? There's, there's blood and tears and, and torn flesh and faces bent in anguish, right? These images lay bare in some way the, the, the terrible beauty and the profound mystery of, of self-giving love. Right, in, in my parishes, both in, in Brownsville and in Boston, uh, both of which were predominantly Spanish-speaking parishioners, uh, would fashion elaborate manger scenes every Christmas uh, and, and, and very elaborate empty tomb scenes for the Triduum uh, around the altar using every <laughs> material imaginable. So for those of us raised, like myself, in sort of a, a cookie-cutter uh, aesthetic milieu of like white suburban Catholicism, right, the decor could seem a little like a lot, right? But it reveals a fundamental truth, right? Beauty is a communal project, right? And it's the cultivation of beauty. It's in the cultivation of beauty that we live our Eucharistic call. Right? And this emphasis on beauty, right? Particularly the beauty of Mary and the saints, and even in some way the strange subversive beauty of the cross, offers what I see as a sort of alternative to the aesthetics of um, certain mass market youth ministry programs, right, which often play on emotion, uh, but offer little in the way of, of beauty in a theologically robust way. So a uh, second, I guess you could say, gift uh, of Latino presence in, in the US church um, is this, this deep and very theologically robust emphasis on beauty. <coughs> and finally, number three, uh, foregoing polarizing binaries for Eucharistic love. <coughs> I apologize for my coughing as well. My, uh, uh, it's the, the, uh, the most effective conduits of, of disease are like small children. I feel like nobody spreads a cold faster than a, than a toddler. <laughs> all of a sudden, my daughter came home from, from school the other day with a, a runny nose, and all of a sudden, my entire house is like deeply ill. So we're like, and she's bouncing around like nothing happens. Thanks, Lucy. So I apologize. My voice is going as well. So, uh, so gift number three of, of Latino Catholicism, foregoing polarizing binaries for Eucharistic love. So much of the polarization right, that characterizes the church in the US today is the result of our minds having been formed to think in dualistic terms, right, in dualisms, Republican or Democrat, right, liberal or conservative. Right? And we even translate these in very bizarre ways to our, to our liturgical existence, right? So we have, okay, are you an adoration Catholic or a social justice Catholic? As though those are, <laughs> as though those are like two different things, right? And we, we, we perpetuate these binaries in, in just about every part of our, <laughs> of our theological imagination, of our national imagination, right? Us and them. This kind of dualistic thinking really stifles and infects our theological imagination and distorts our capacity to love. <coughs> and as we see basically every day in new and ever more horrifying ways, uh, it matters, right? My doctoral dissertation was um, an ethnographic study of a highly diverse Catholic parish <coughs> um, in the, with an emphasis on the community's intercultural, liturgical, and ritual practice. And in nearly all of my interviews with, with English-speaking members, of the parish with, with the English-speaking community. When I asked about the challenge of ministry in diverse settings, they spoke in these same binaries, right? These same dualistic terms. So they would talk about the parish's progressives versus the conservatives, right? The Vatican II people versus the traditionalists. Again, like very interesting <laughs> dichotomy there, right? More educated versus less educated, English community versus Spanish community, et cetera, et cetera. 
even when they were noting legitimate divisions within the parish, it seemed that for my English speakers, right, there were only two sides to every issue, always in some way a variation on the classic liberal conservative binary, and everybody was either on one side or the other. Right? My Spanish-speaking participants, however, were much more nuanced in their characterizations of community life at the parish. So they, unlike the English-speaking uh, community members, right, they didn't describe community dynamics in these stark binary terms. Right? Everything wasn't liberal, conservative, progressive, or traditional. Right? Instead, many in my interviews actually cited the Eucharist as a source of unity among all of the parishioners. Um, as one uh, lay leader, longtime lay leader from the Spanish community told me, I said, so, you know, what keeps you coming back? You know, what's, what, what for you has been at the heart of your, of your ability to work interculturally with members of the other community? And she says, for me, it's the Eucharist, right? I recognize that we're all here for the Eucharist. At the end of the day, you know, our differences matter, um, but we're all united um, in our love for the Eucharist. I thought, wow, oh, you, you should be teaching this class. That's, that's very beautiful. So this afternoon, right, we've discussed transformations underway in the U.S. Catholic Church, explored how ritual can become uh, the foundation for building community across borders of culture in our parishes and schools, uh, and examined three particular ways in which Latinos are evangelizing the U.S. Church with respect to ministry, uh, beauty, and Eucharistic love. I want to conclude now uh, by returning to Pope Francis, with whom we, uh, with whom we began an hour ago. <coughs> in his recently published Apostolic Exhortation, Right, rejoice and be glad. <coughs> Pardon me. Francis writes, citing uh, the Vatican II document, Lumen Gentium, writes, the Holy Spirit bestows holiness and abundance among God's holy and faithful people. For, quote, it has pleased God to make men and women holy and to save them, not as individuals, without any bond between them, but rather as a people, right, who might acknowledge him in truth and serve him in holiness. In salvation history, Francis writes, the Lord saved a people, right? We're never completely ourselves unless we belong to a people. That's why no one is saved alone as an isolated individual. Rather, God draws us to himself, taking into account the complex fabric of interpersonal relationships present in a human community. God wanted to enter into the life and history of a people. We don't practice solidarity to be politically correct, as we say, or to celebrate diversity in a superficial way, right? We do so because we believe that salvation is fundamentally communal, right? In the Catholic imagination, there's no such thing as a personal Lord and Savior, right? Solidarity is, ex is an expression of our peoplehood, right? Our fundamental oneness, the fullness of that communion, united across borders as the body of Christ. <coughs> So I would love to hear from you now in the about 20 minutes or so that we have left. And I know I'm the only thing standing between you and dinner. Um, so we can also just go now. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm, I have some right here. It's more just my, my voice is going. Um, I would love to, uh, to hear you know, how you see these dynamics reflected in your own parish context, in your own schools, and to, um, to hear reflections from, you know, from the wisdom that you all bring here. If I could, I'd like to share, um, this is from Claudia Cecilia. She is a, a young girl from Mexico. I mean, she's a woman now, but um, she was in a level three atrium. She speaks of a white page, the blank page, mm -hmm. which is this next moment in history that God invites us to write. Mm -hmm. And she speaks about invisible bridges, which comes out of a work we have in level three. Just looking at, at the plan of God mm -hmm. is, is one of these invisible bridges we build mm -hmm. with each other. So I just thought, her words would just um, yeah, please echo share what them. you've been, is that okay? That'd be wonderful. I want to have a very brilliant light. I am part of the white page, as, and my mission is to build invisible bridges with other people and with people of other centuries. I am part of the light of the world as much as everyone who lives on it. I will build invisible bridges, leaving my own wisdom to other people. God has given me many gifts, and I must make the most of them. I do not know if I am more than others, but I would like to know for sure that in front of God and my neighbors, I would be a good, noble, respectful woman with a light that cannot be extinguished as the light God has given me when I was born 
and which I reinforce in communion. I know that someday when God calls me, I with my efforts will be a messenger of peace. Mm -hmm. So that's what the children bring. And we have a string of pearls along the border. Children from both sides of the border enter into the atrium together. Mm -hmm. I mean, she is further south than mm -hmm. Wow, that's, no, that's, I mean, I love that image of the invisible bridge. That's, that's a really beautiful, thank you for sharing that. When you were talking about ritual as a way to unify, I was mm -hmm. thinking about the wonderful experience of going to the 60th anniversary of the, of the celebration in Arizona, the Catechesis of the Good <coughs> an international celebration and there were um, contingencies that, that or rather um, groups that came from all these different atria and different um, confessional um, groups mm -hmm. and what was so beautiful was how many times you know there was a song that maybe we've sung in the atrium and there people were like had translated into their country and so we had that common thing or of course the gestures could be recognized all these materials and I thought man this I mean, Sophia couldn't have known just mm -hmm. what an incredible work of union this is. Just like the Mass is, because there is a common, you know, language of signs mm -hmm. that these children in the Marian or Marianite Rite in Syria, or the ones that were going off to China, being instructed by the Australians, or the one who were, who were working in, you know, the, the Episcopal Church and, you know, in the tr more traditional Catholics. It was like we had a common. Mm -hmm. We had a common love, which also we had the mystery of God, but we had the mystery of the child who we mm -hmm. were all recognizing was showing us the same essential realities. Mm -hmm. And so it's just incredible the, the possibilities for, for union going forward as these children grow up and have this language of bridges and, um, you know, that the peace goes out mm -hmm. everywhere. So I just wanted that's, to share that. Thank you for sharing. That's so, that's so beautiful and I can see too and I, I know that one thing that um, Montessori classrooms are, are so good at is, is uh, being a space for diverse learners um, and I wonder if part of that is because of this very very embodied very kind of a very capacious approach to, to education where, where students are always working together and, yeah, and it's the materials and the work of the hands mm -hmm. that nice. There's one other thing, when you talked mm -hmm. about the evangelizing capacity of beauty, mm -hmm. um, I mean, that is something very Montessori mm -hmm. as well, but also Guadalupe just hit me because, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Juan Diego was first made to turn by the sound of music, mm -hmm. and then dancing, you know, she's in that image with her leg up, she's dancing, mm -hmm. and that's very much part of that culture, and I think that some of the you know, maybe more Western way is, is, is afraid of embodying and the joy in, in singing outwardly together, waving hands or um, dancing and letting the expressions of joy that are in the Old Testament, you know, dancing before the tabernacle and everything, come back mm -hmm. to feel that joy in your whole body. Yes. And I think that the Latinos have no problem with that. Mm -hmm. You know, I took my children right after my son John Bosco was born. Chicago had the, the remains of John Bosco coming to a parish that was all Latino. We get there. Now my children didn't need to understand. They got their mm -hmm. little handkerchiefs. Everybody got more like, Viva John Bosco, Viva Bosco. <laughs> Just singing and dancing for hours. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's true. And, there, and it's a liberation in allowing ourselves to become part of it. Because I think part of a, a, one negative aspect of sort of Euro-American society is that not only do we not always feel comfortable with sort of embodied expressions of community, which is fine, everybody has their own way, but, but there's often a suspicion, right, of these very um, kind of emotive, affective ways of, of being church and of being society. And so people often look down on, for example, Spanish-speaking parishes as, oh, those simple people, da-da-da, or wow, this is, these, that, that expression of emotion really makes me uncomfortable, um, right? I, I feel very suspicious of that. Um, and how beautiful, right, to kind of let our guard down and enter into that joyous space. Um, those are, thank you for sharing those, those really beautiful examples. Thank you. Hi, so I have a very practical question. So yeah. I'm in New York, I'm a DRE, but I also uh, chair a board for the young adult uh, office in the Archdiocese. And so we offer some, hopefully some guidance towards that young adult office mm -hmm. to try to you know, encourage the ministry mm -hmm. in, in New York. 
one of the things that I've been trying to um, develop a little bit is a greater community between uh, different cultures within mm -hmm. within the archdiocese. And <coughs> when I've asked and requested for uh, just a, basically more of a focus on that, the uh, response was that efforts were seen as intrusive upon the communities, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that the uh, particularly Latino communities mm -hmm. or Hispanic communities were quite comfortable doing their own thing mm -hmm. in a sense, and that they were, they were thriving and growing, but the, the togetherness was a bit more of a struggle. Mm -hmm. So there would be monthly masses in, in mm -hmm. St. Patrick's Cathedral, and everybody would come together, which is lovely. I was like, I, I want more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so it was more, it was a selfish thing in a sense because um, having worked uh, in, in similar contexts, it gave me such a great life. So I was curious if that's come up in your research and, and what kind of a response or explanation. Definitely. Yeah. Um, very much so. Um, and I think that that's, it's, that's something that um, is, a, is a, din a dynamic that we hear very often, um, you know, whether at the diocesan level or the parish level, sort of, you know, people, let's say, from the, the English-speaking community wanting to reach out, wanting to do something, wanting to have some sort of uh, intercultural ministry or life or bilingual mass or whatever in the Spanish-speaking community, to use a, the sort of most typical iteration of that shared parish life, is very content to sort of be in their own space, do their own thing. And part of that is because, right, at least for, you know, for English speakers, for your Americans now, this notion of diversity is becoming this sort of like, oh, yes, we want to cultivate this. This is so interesting, you know. Um, whereas uh, for, you know, for Latinos, um, diversity is, is a fact of life, right? If they want to practice their faith in their own language, they're going to be part of a diverse community because very few parishes are all Spanish speaking. So it's not, it's less a like selling point of life, like, oh, let's be a diverse community and more of like a fact of ecclesial existence. Like, yes, diversity is something that I have to put up with in order to practice my faith um, in a language that I understand in a cultural context in which I feel comfortable. Um, and I think part of it too is that legacy of, of sort of, whether you want to call it colonialization or, or, or co-optation or wherever where gestures toward you know, doing things that were intercultural, having a space that was that was bilingual or diverse or intercultural, often meant doing things on the terms of those who were kind of extending the invitation. You know, so it it was always the space in which, you know, they were invited into as guests, but rarely as hosts. Um, and I think, I mean, the answer is that, like, yeah, it's just it's hard, yeah. um, and it can be hard to feel like you're forcing something that doesn't feel organic. Um, mm -hmm. Like a, an intercultural mass mm -hmm. or something like that. Not even that. Yeah. Just more so to say, how how do we encourage participation yeah. together? Not not a specific mm -hmm. let's come together and do this thing. Just yeah. organically. Yeah. Uh, because I, I it's just very apparent that the two you know worlds are operating. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it, there are there are examples of places that are doing this well but but often they see it's it's hard to generalize about best practices yeah. right now because i think most dioceses and most parishes are articulating the exact same experience that you're having here um, and typically where that community has been generated organically it is very much the result of a couple of people who are friends for example like starting something um you know or just kind of it, it's emerged as you said sort of organically um, and, I, and it's just, I, I think that, you know, the, the best answer that I can give now, which is like so dissatisfying, is to like affirm that this is, this is a conversation that so many people are having and so few people are able to do successfully. Um, and where it's been successful, um, it's been successful um, typically because of pre-existing relationships that have happened you know, a point person in this community, a point person in this community, doing things often that are very like social, you know, not like in, in a liturgical space, you know, doing a, you know, you know, night out or whatever, um, and kind of letting things develop organically from there. Um, but it's, it's, it's very, very hard. Yeah. yeah you're, you're not alone. You're not alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Uh, like you say, I'm from Los Angeles. So we've been doing this for a long, long yes. time. Um, I was in a parish, uh, and they're a very vibrant Spanish-speaking community. 
um, and, uh, and, and an English speaking community. Their tradition was to come together for uh, uh, trade on, mm -hmm. especially Holy Thursday. Mm -hmm. Holy Thursday, not mm -hmm. even Good Friday, Holy Thursday. So that was always the attempt to actually be uh, bilingual. Mm -hmm. um, and I experienced it, and I was watching. Uh, in this church, the music ministry was behind the altar, so you could mm -hmm. watch the music ministry happen. And there was the Spanish music ministry, and there was the English music ministry, and it was the Battle of the Bands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They never played together. Fascinating. And there was a year, because I'm music, mm -hmm. I'm a music minister as well, that I jumped in instead of the uh, uh, the white group. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was like, listen, I was singing the, you know, mm -hmm. you know, I was just like <laughs> screaming. That, but what I experienced. Was not much of a welcome from the Spanish speaking mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. And I was surprised about that. Mm -hmm. Actually, I wasn't surprised about that because mm -hmm. it took two to stand up mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I feel like there's an elephant in the room mm -hmm. in that parish that nobody's recognizing mm -hmm. and nobody's doing anything and it comes from the pastor. Mm -hmm. The pastor was really bilingual, uh, bicultural. He, you know, he was comfortable, but he didn't own. That there was an animosity, not just the white people mm -hmm. saying this is our parish, but to the both mm -hmm. and to facilitate somehow mm -hmm. new friendships mm -hmm. or to name. Do you realize that there is some hostility mm -hmm. here, and uh, in both communities or in all the communities? And what are we going to do about that? Mm -hmm. What are we going to do about that? I think is the one of the great challenges that. Leadership, mm -hmm. the pastor, along with the staff or whoever, has to own mm -hmm. and has to figure out. Okay, in five years, we're going to get better. Mm -hmm. And you're exactly right that naming it is the most uncomfortable part. And you're exactly right too that this is, as you said, it, it, it takes two to tango. Right? The the suspicion is often mutual. Right? It's not just about you know. The Euro-American community say, you know, we built this parish, da da da. The newcomers, no, it's it's very often, you know, a, a mutual suspicion, and then there's a there's a number of of really deep-seated and often very, you know, good reasons for that. Um, but I think naming it, you know, and, and, and getting the pastor on board, getting the leadership on board, um, and, and bringing the communities together to to name that, right? And I think that that can be a liberating moment in a, in a, the parish that I worked in in Boston. Um, there were a couple of very successful, what they called listening sessions, um, in which uh, members of, of different communities were invited to, because this parish actually was interesting, there was also a, there was a, a white community and an a, a African-American community within the English-speaking uh, community, and then um, the Spanish-speaking community, which was primarily Dominican and Puerto Rican, but was also very internally diverse. Um, so it was, there, was a lot, there was a lot there. Um, and they would hold these listening sessions in which specific members um, of a given community were invited to just sort of share their story, either their, share, you know, their story of, of you know, growing up Catholic or coming to this country or what have you, or growing up in Boston, um, and also just their kind of you know, uh, sensitive, but also authentic feelings about you know, the state of the parish today. And, and that became the basis for a lot of future conversations. But always done within this very, I guess you could call it ritualized environment, right? So it wasn't, a, it wasn't a everybody just say what's on their mind. Right? It, was, it was very you know, carefully conducted and orchestrated by someone who was in the leadership. But you're exactly right that that, that naming often has to come first. And it's very, it's very hard. And it's very vulnerable. I think uh, as we are experiencing immigration as humanity has never experienced, um, we've not had different languages mm -hmm. where people literally, I don't understand you exactly. at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and that in itself mm -hmm. is just off-putting. It is. It yeah. is just really, really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. Not to mention who's got the power and who doesn't, and how that power is expressed yes. in ways that we're unconscious of. Yes. Um, it, so it's just really. It's it's 
it's hard work and it's careful work. And in some way, just as you said, this is sort of this is the question, right? In in sort of the our ecclesial landscape in the 21st century, like what does it mean to be a parish community, right? What does it mean to call our parish a community? Can we call this parish a community? Exactly, and I think you know right now we're as just as you said we're sort of operating often in these separate spheres, um, and kind of live and let live very often, and it's easier in some ways to avoid one another. But there's going to be a reckoning, <laughs> right, in in five or ten or fifteen years, and often in parishes currently, um, you know, in which it, it does come to the point when communities have to say, what are we doing here? Um, and you know, that's the point in which we need very thoughtful and informed leadership to help guide those very painful conversations. Oh. Um, I have just a, a question about what I like to call the 85%, which is 60%, um, like you said, of children and Catholic youth in the country, 18 and under our, our Hispanic Latino descent, 85% of Catholic leaders in our country are of Anglo descent. And so that's a, right now, you know, so that's a big um, distinction between the two. And so what do you, you talked about how there's a need for us to expect discomfort. But for that culture that's used to the, you know, the binary, the me versus you, how do you go about opening the hearts of the 85% to expect discomfort? Yeah, that's, that's a, in some ways a very relevant yeah, say more, actually say more about that because that's... So I, I actually do a lot of work with this. Um, you know, the Federation of Catechesis for Hispanics, and I, I've, I've taught a national class on it through Sadlier. Mm -hmm. um, I have experience from, now you know what I do at, in the Diocese of Venice, but being a director of religious education at one of the most multicultural parishes in the D.C. area, you know, like New York, St. Patrick's, and. We had over 60 nationalities represented, multiple rights, um, 13 la languages spoken at the parish, and there's 16,000 parishioners. And I was the, you know, the director, and uh, we grew that that religious education program from 750 to over 1,200 in like four years, and we grew the parent catechesis, family catechesis from zero to over 3,000 families catechized in three years. I've heard of this parish, actually, so it's wonderful to meet you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the kids, actually, because you're right about the, the whole and you know, the youth, the, um, I didn't know what to do with them. Mm -hmm. There were just so many. There were hundreds of kids, so and they would just be calling their friends who aren't even Catholic and saying, hey, we're hanging out here. Mm -hmm. So the church was just filled. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and so what I found is it's a fear of the unknown for the 85%. And that's what I do most of my work on because um, it's a fear of letting go of what we're comfortable with and used to and understanding that the new evangelization is, is right here in our, our community. And we have to open our hearts to diversity to missionary work and it's no longer going to you know Lima, Peru on a mission trip. It's right. it's, it's here and now and this is the work of the new evangelization. Um, but it's 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 this fear of insecurity because when I teach that's what I most hear. Like I, but I don't speak Spanish. But I don't know anything about this culture or that culture. And you know, my response is always, okay, join salvation history. You know, Gideon hid in a wine press and God called him a warrior. Moses didn't want to go. You know, he said, I can't even talk. What are you talking about? You know, he's like going to Aaron. Said to Aaron, I was like, okay, take Aaron too. You know, uh, God has always called the unqualified or the Right? Yeah. And so the 85 percent, you're the ones who are chosen. That's kind of how I approach it. But I'd love to hear your... And I, and I, what I often say to, to people who, you know, I, I don't speak Spanish, you know, and I often say, great, 
you don't have to because <laughs> um, there's a lot of people who do right and that's where we come to empowering people from within the community you know the the you know the charismatic teen you know who seems to be like the ringleader of getting all of friends to come like okay great you're now in charge of the youth leadership team <laughs> congratulations you know uh, it really empowering people from within that community you know asking people directly by name empowering people from within the Spanish community, from whatever community, um, to be the leaders, right? And then the harder part, administratively, compensating them <laughs> equally to what uh, leaders from within the English speaking community are compensated. So part of the, part of the, the hard thing about this sort of chicken and egg dynamic of um, you know, the, the real lack that we have of particularly uh, Hispanic youth leaders, uh, young, young people leaders, um, is that uh, often like youth ministry positions are are paid not often very much <laughs> you're not going to like live in beverly hills in a mansion by being a youth minister but you are compensated typically by your parish um but often someone will be tapped from the you know the spanish-speaking community to um you know lead a spanish-speaking youth group in the parish as a volunteer you know so there's not equity and compensation there so while one person is being compensated for their work the other person is asked to be doing it at a volunteer basis you know and so it's 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 a question that we have to start asking at every single level of the church how do we empower leaders how do we compensate leaders how do we train leaders how do we train priests how do we train people getting certificates or graduate degrees in in ministry to expect this landscape um, you know, because that's the other problem is people say, I feel really unqualified for this because I got my MDiv or I got a degree in pastoral ministry or I went through a diocesan certificate program and nobody ever told me that this is the reality of the church. Um, I mean, I, I did my, my graduate work at Boston College. There was one class on like diversity in the church and everybody who took the class said, this should be a required class. Like, I, it terrifies me to think that people are graduating from this institution and going out and doing ministry in parishes and don't know these basic facts about the transformations that are, that are happening in the Catholic Church. Um, and so I think it's, it's a conversation that we have to have at every possible level of, of, of training, of ministry. I think you're exactly right, and I would love afterwards to hear more about your experience, which is phenomenal as well.